Welcome, I'm Tracy Smith and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. Actor Michelle Yeoh, the powerhouse lead in Everything Everywhere All at Once, is hitting a new career high in her 60s after decades in front of the camera. As Seth Doan found out, she hopes to show Hollywood that age doesn't have to slow women down. You've had a rich career. Oh, I had a spectacular career. But you know, you don't want it to just slow down or end because you have gotten to a certain age. And you know, you start getting scripts where the guy, your hero, is still in his 50s, 60s, you know, some even more. And then they get to go on the adventure with your daughter. And then you go like, no, come on, guys. Give me a give me a chance because I feel that I am still able to do all that. Yeah. Later in the show, Michelle Yeoh on her struggle to let a body double do some of the action star's stunts. As you've gone on and been in bigger and bigger budget movies, there have been more stunt doubles who have taken some of what you would have done before. Yes. Is it difficult? At first it was because you feel like such a fake. <laughs> I think that was the most difficult thing. It's like, I remember I used to say, but I can do it, you know? You know that, right? They say, I know you can do it, but you don't need to do it. And you go like, you know, but what if the audience says she didn't do it though? <laughs> you know, that, I think that was the biggest dilemma I always have. Then Faith Saley takes us to what may be the sweetest town in the country. Mackinac Island, between Michigan's upper and lower peninsulas, is the self-proclaimed fudge capital of America. The car-free oasis has more than a dozen fudge shops. During the summer, fudge-loving tourists, affectionately called fudgies, flood the island. To meet the demand, each shop can make up to 500 pounds a day. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. Actor Michelle Yeoh made a name for herself in Hong Kong action movies. Now Hollywood is finally recognizing the star's gifts. Seth Doan caught up with her in Paris to discuss acting, aging, and art. I do all the roundhouse kicks and all the, whether it's the side kicks, the back kicks. It's not so a typical it morning spot. routine. And just do the shadow boxing by myself. In your bathroom. In my bathroom. Every morning. Every morning before I go to work. That Especially work showcases son, Michelle Yeoh's physicality. <laughs> Be it mesmerizing battle scenes and crouching tiger hidden dragon, or daring stunts as a Bond girl in Tomorrow Never Dies. I know this much. And she packs that intensity into a simple line of dialogue in Crazy Rich Asians. You will never be enough. Now, after decades of acting, she's getting more recognition than ever. Time magazine named Yo Icon of the Year. And she's the lead role in the trippy Everything Everywhere All at Once. Let me finish talking with my husband. He needs to know how good my life could have been. Is it true that the part was originally written as a male lead, that it was Yeah, it was written for Jackie, Jackie Chan. Jackie Chan. Yes, because he texted me and he said, hey, congratulations on your film. Do you know your directors came to look for me first? I said, yes, bro, I you know. know. And so then I said, you're lost, bro, thank you. <laughs> it's quite an odyssey for a ballet dancer from Malaysia who saw parallels in her training. Moving, you know, like in dance, you go one, two, three, one, two, three. In martial arts, like one, two, three, four. <laughs> She found a way to cut her own path into film via 1980s Hong Kong martial arts movies. Now, in Everything Everywhere All at Once, she plays an unlikely universe-hopping superhero. I hadn't read anything that was so original. It really had everything and everywhere I wanted to go as an actor. You play so many different parts. Mm -hmm in that yes. one role. A completely different person, completely different role. But how is that as an actor? What are the mechanics of switching like that? Challenging. The film requires both mental and punishing physical acrobatics. 
the actor, famous for doing her own stunts, starts each day with a sort of meditation apology. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. Thank you. I love you. This body takes a lot of bumps and bruises, so that is my way of saying thank you to it. So all these kind of things... She showed us her stretching routine, which starts before she gets out of bed. It's like, you must know your body. Yo seems to defy aging, but was still surprised to get this role. It was amazing to, to think that at this point in my career, because, you know, it's like the older you get, they see you by your age rather than see you by your capability. But, she says, the directing duo known as the Daniels saw it differently. They thought, you know, she can do this. If anybody can in our industry who can fight, who can be funny, who can, uh, you know, be dramatic and sincere and all those kind of things, we believe Michelle will be able to do it. And to receive that, you don't know how joyful. It touches you. Yes. Why so deeply? <sighs> it's like... When someone gives you the opportunity to show what you're capable of. Yeah. <laughs> you thought that that wouldn't happen at this point in your career? Yes. You've had a rich career. Oh, I had a spectacular career. But you know, you don't want it to just slow down or end because you have gotten to a certain age. And you know, you start getting scripts where the guy, your hero, is still in his 50s, 60s, you know, some even more. And then they get to go on the adventure with your daughter. And then you go like, no, come on, guys, give me a, give me a chance because I feel that I am still able to do all that. Yeah. Yo also pushed back against being cast as the damsel in distress early in her career. Look at me. Look at me. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I kind of wince sometimes when I'm watching you do these things. Me too. I go like, oh, what was I thinking? There were close calls, injuries, and in 1988, after marrying movie producer Dixon Poon, a brief retirement. I wanted to be a mother. I wanted to be a good wife and find something else that I could um, embark on. But then... Um, I think the, the biggest issue was because I couldn't have kids. And I knew that this was a family who needed kids. And it was a choice. A choice to leave the marriage. How hard was that? Well, it's, it's devastating, you know, but it is, it is life. <laughs> now I have godchildren. I have beautiful godchildren. They are like my extended family. Friends, kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Family is important to you. Oh, the most important. Ali. Yo introduced us to one of those friends in Paris at his three Michelin star restaurant, Guy Savoie. There's French style and Italian style. style. Mm -hmm. And this one is Italian style. <laughs> <laughs> I like the Italian style. I like style. the Italian style. <laughs> you prefer yeah. Italian style? Absolutely. Me too, me too. Guy Savoie became a friend through Yo's partner of 18 years, Jean Tot a prominent French motorsport executive and former Ferrari CEO. You both have big careers. It must be hard to No, I think you find, you find time. And I, it becomes more precious, right? So when you are together, it's fabulous. Together, they champion road safety programs for the United Nations. She's wonderful. I'm sorry we don't get to meet you. Todd, who was traveling, video called several times while we were shooting. Ciao, <laughs> baby. What I love is he is what you see, is what you get. And uh, he's very straightforward, he's very honest. He's one of the most loyal person I have ever met. You see, I'm a road safety. Yo had just flown to Paris from L.A., but we never saw the star fuss over lighting or makeup. She calls her schedule insane, but good. You go where the work takes you. And I think that has always been my wish as well. It's like I, I want to have a kind of job that takes me and let me visit new places, meet new people. And I guess I got my wish because, you know. <laughs> you know me, I always make that he, she. In Chinese, just one word. Another wish is to carry others with her, which made this latest role so appealing. 
Anyways, my English is fine. What I found so beautiful was it was giving a voice to a very ordinary woman, aging immigrant woman, who's never really had a voice before. You know, it's, it's, it's hard being, looking like this because I have a lot of Asians who come up to me and say, thank you for doing this because now I see it's possible for us to be there. So it is, it is very important because what we're giving to all the Asian faces is that we're not invisible. She's hardly invisible today. Yes, that's both a responsibility and something to relish. It's so fun. You know, now when I go on the streets and the younger kids, you know, they're shy, but they'll walk up and say, we think you're cool. Can we do a picture with you? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> Up next, an exclusive excerpt from Michelle Yeoh's chat. You can only see right here on CBS News Streaming. Stay with us. As promised, here's more from Seth Doan's conversation with Michelle Yeoh. Can we do a, a quick getting to know you rapid fire question? Sure. Ooh. Favorite city? Oh, you get me into trouble. Oh, oh God, not saying. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Second rapid fire, not rapid fire question. Uh, biggest weakness? Biggest weakness? Red wine. Ooh, that was my next question was going to be favorite drink. <laughs> Are they the same? Yeah, they're the same. <laughs> uh, All right, then sh champagne, rosé champagne. <laughs> Biggest regret? Hmm, that's a very good one because I never think of that. I don't try to regret anything. I just move on. But if one thing I would say, I wish I learned Mandarin when I was a kid. I know how to write it. You have a bunch of home is in a number of places right now. Mm -hmm. Take... I used to live in Hong Kong because I, that's where I started my career. And then because of Jean, we sort of lived between Geneva. That's his, our main residence for him. And we have a that place because he's French in Paris and then my family in Malaysia where I live as well but I haven't really really lived there because I don't work from there but I'm a Malaysian. You grew up in a mining town yes. in Malaysia. Yes, people, Malaysia. When you think back to growing up in Malaysia what are the memories? Oh I loved it. I think I was a little bit of a playboy, a playboy. <laughs> <laughs> Did I say Playboy? You said a bit of a Playboy. I don't know. Maybe this is a new what chapter. You, no, Tomboy. Tomboy. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I was a bit of a Playboy. It's just now coming out. I don't know. Like, well, I, really some to new be, I really wanted to be James Bond, okay? <laughs> when I was a kid, I wanted to be Tarzan. <laughs> so they, 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 now you got it. So. <laughs> uh, you were a Tomboy. Yeah, totally. Because. Uh, my dad was a very uh, outgoing nature person. He loved fishing, so we would go to the sea almost every other weekend. Um, we would live like with a generator. We'd be in the middle of an ocean on those kelongs, where it's just a platform launched into the, the, the seabed where they, the, the fish will come into the nets and things. And then we would go out on a boat and fish. So we lived a very mm, nature sense of uh, growing up and in Ipo where I am we have like the, the mountain size the hill size uh, around us so I would go hiking in the morning and then we have Cameron Highlands which is not far away and then we have the sea so if I was a um, nature child I was a out, complete outdoor person I used to climb trees I think the only thing that gave me a sense where I was like the girl was because I loved ballet so going to ballet class, putting on that little tutu. <laughs> that was my saving grace. Saving grace from your mother's perspective, at least. Yes. But my mother was very outgoing as well, because, you know, she played badminton until she was in her 70s, you know. So we, we, we come from a family that say we play table tennis, we swim, we dive, we do all the crazy things. As you gone on and been in bigger and bigger budget movies, there have been more stunt doubles who have taken some of what you would have done before. Yes. Is it difficult? At first it was because you feel like such a fake. <laughs> I think that was the most difficult thing. It's like, I remember I used to say, but 
I can do it, you know? You know that, right? He said, I know you can do it, but you don't need to do it. And you go like, you know, but what if the audience says she didn't do it though? <laughs> you know, that, I think that was the biggest dilemma I always have. And then, I, and then I meet up with Jackie and Jet Li and they're like, hey, we paid our dues, okay? It's okay to say, let someone else do it, you know? So now I'm like, okay, you can do it. <laughs> How was it to be a Bond girl? Fabulous, really, really, truly. I mean, it's such an amazing legacy to be part of. Uh, I mean, it's about 60 years. We celebrated 60 years of Bond. It's so loved, uh, not just it's so nurtured and cared for by Barbara Broccoli and Michael Wilson because you know Cubby Broccoli was the one who, who started it all. Um, and so in his spirit, in his vision, the two of them have expanded and broadened it. And now, you know, it, you can see the, the, how it evolved. Bond has evolved over the years. And I think that's the only way you can survive, you know, in this world. Uh, James Cameron. Yes. You're working with him now. I am working with James Cameron. Yeah. <laughs> You've worked with some pretty big directors. I have worked with the most amazing directors, and I hope it never stops there. But, you know, throw me Spielberg, man, throw me Scorsese, throw me, like, I go, why? Just throw them at me. Um, yes, it's, they're just to watch someone who is so creative. It's a gift. And you're going to be continuing to work with him. These Avatar sequels come out every couple of years? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Just know that I'm working with him, okay? <laughs> but it has been reported that you're going to be in each of these films, each of these Avatar. I will be in there. And they continue. There are several of them. Yes, there's two, three, four, and five, I think. Yeah. But I don't know which one. <laughs> but this is a major ongoing commitment. Yes. That's, I think that's the thing is like if you find something you love, it's nice that it's ongoing because it, it creates such a sense of stability. Um, and especially when you are with a family that is, has been there and for good reasons, uh, it's a, a real gift to be part of that. Up next, America's fudge capital. Welcome back. Believe it or not, the invention of fudge may have been an accident, but one Michigan town's obsession with the candy is anything but. Here's Faith Saley. Original Murdoch's Fudge has been in operation since 1887, when it first opened its doors on Michigan's Mackinac Island. Fudge is kind of king in, in Michigan. Bob Benzer is now the owner. I put a little piece of fudge sometimes in my coffee in the morning, a little piece of double chocolate fudge. You get the sugar, the cream. Genius. So yeah, cafe mocha type uh, flavor. Fudge is Mackinac Island, synonymous with Mackinac Island. Mackinac Island, between Michigan's upper and lower peninsulas, is the self-proclaimed fudge capital of America. The car-free oasis has more than a dozen fudge shops. During the summer, fudge-loving tourists, affectionately called fudgies, flood the island. To meet the demand, each shop can make up to 500 pounds a day. But even when temperatures and tourism cool, fudge remains a hot item. That appetite for fudge dates back more than a century. Pour into grease pans and mark off into squares. So it definitely sounds like fudge. Joyce White is a food historian. We met her at the Maryland Center for History and Culture in Baltimore. Fudge is actually based on a recipe for chocolate caramels, which was very, very similar. What probably happened is that there was someone in Baltimore messed it up, fadged it. Fadge is a word that means you messed up. I fadged it or I fudged it. Yeah. Nowadays, we'd use a different F word to say that, right? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> By 1888, that Baltimore recipe was passed along to a student at Vassar College, then all women, in Poughkeepsie, New York. Women would make 
fudge in their dorm rooms, um, doing something against the rules in the late evenings, and uh, trying to get away with something not condoned in the rule book. At the same time, men at men's colleges were out carousing. Yes. It was a woman's way of being rebellious, you know, cooking in the dorm at night. Open flame, after hours. Absolutely not breaking the rules. Right, <laughs> breaking every rule in a, in a way that was still considered ladylike. Ladylike, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Soon, so-called Vassar fudge ended up at other women's colleges, even making headlines around the country. Fast forward a century and the recipe for fudge hasn't changed much. Sugar, milk, butter, and chocolate mixed. Poured onto a marble slab. Then worked until the mixture solidifies. Here at Original Murdoch's St. Ignace location, veteran fudge maker Carnell Samuels turns the 45 minute process into a 30 pound loaf of fudge. Down and out, just grab it so. Scoop. All right, right here? There you go. So push. Look at that. You're a good teacher. Making fudge is certainly harder than it looks. But if its history has taught us anything, it's that mistakes can be sweet. Any way you slice it. I'm Tracy Smith. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you here next time on Here Comes the Sun.